Welcome to the TaxCast from the Tax Justice Network, with me, Naomi Fowler. Coming up later, nearly five years ago now, the LuxLeaks whistleblowers exposed outrageous tax deals offered to huge multinational companies by European Union member states. Will they ever be investigated? Well, it's a burning question, really. The EU's competition commissioner, Marguerite Vestager, said, yes, we, we're looking at these documents. She said, we will examine it and we'll evaluate whether or not this leads to an opening of a case. And we've not heard anything since. First, here's a quick roundup of this month's tax justice news. According to campaigners, the European Union needs much stronger legislation to protect whistleblowers. The proposed EU directive, as it stands at the moment, wouldn't have protected the LuxLeaks whistleblowers from the legal attacks on them by big four accountancy firm PricewaterhouseCoopers and the Luxembourg authorities. So, back to the drawing board for them, I hope. The British government has creatively reinterpreted what was supposed to be a 2020 deadline for its satellite havens, the overseas territories, to open public registers of the real owners of companies. Apparently, that 2020 deadline was only meant to be the deadline for the draft legislation. The overseas territories are now only expected to have fully functioning public registers in place by the end of 2023. Note the words expected to have. (laughs) The banking giant UBS has to pay a record $5.1 billion fine for enabling tax evasion in France via Swiss bank accounts. Amazon's one of the world's biggest monopolies, but it turns out it paid zero federal income taxes in the United States in 2018. It's holding a competition at the moment among US states to see which one of them will offer its non-unionised, small business killing company the most in subsidies and tax breaks to locate its second headquarters there. New York was proposing to offer the company $3 billion in subsidies, but after a big fight from local politicians, Amazon pulled out. This is Senator Mike Gennaris, who fought against the giveaway. The news for Amazon is that they're not bigger than New York City, at least not yet. Uh, They may think that they get to dictate terms to governments. Uh, Here is a company that uh, has concentrated so much power that they think they can dictate to states and cities how much money of theirs they want to take to grace us with their presence. Uh, There is example after example of public dollars being wasted, being given to the most giant corporations among us, and disaster after disaster follows. There is a reason Europe bans subsidies like this. Uh, We should take a long, hard look about whether we should do the same thing. We aim to cover that whole issue soon here on the TaxCast, on how business should not be conducted. And finally, the Australian government has abandoned its plan for a register of the real owners of companies. They had committed themselves to a register after the heat came from the Panama Papers scandal. Those are the news headlines. Now we're going to talk to John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network for his take on this month. OK, John, this month we're going to talk about a trend that's been accelerating in the world of so-called aid, of uh, pushing public-private partnerships and public finance initiatives and all sorts of privatisation models on poorer countries. These are policies that we know have failed in wealthier countries, uh, great cost. But it's made lots of money for the big four accountancy firms, among other people. Before we talk about that, this financialisation of aid that we're seeing, uh, we should just say that there is a lot wrong with overseas aid, not least because uh, there's far more flowing out of the developing world, of the global south, than is going in in so-called aid. Yeah, I think it's important to make a distinction between two different types of aid. There's the humanitarian aid when there's a disaster, an emergency of any kind. It's absolutely right that other countries react fast and appropriately to meet the humanitarian crisis. The other type of aid, which we're generally much more sceptical about, is the so-called developmental aid. What we've seen is that developmental aid has so often been linked to trade deals, to uh, allowing companies from the host country better access to the markets and so on of the poorer countries. This kind of developmental assistance, most of us would expect somehow aid is helping the poorest, not the richest. But in far too many cases, we've seen aid being targeted at uh, big corporations from the West, helping them to engage in huge 
infrastructure developments and all sorts of consulting firms. You mentioned the big four accountants, but there are also all sorts of other agencies involved who are creaming off a large part of the, the value of that aid. Right, and we're seeing financialization of everything across all kinds of different areas. Aid is just one other facet of that. Let's talk a bit about what kind of uh, changes we're seeing. How is aid being financialized? Right, well, financialization of the so-called development assistance has been steadily growing for a very long time, isn't it? But we saw it ex- accelerate after the great financial crisis, the banking crisis. What was happening before that and before 2007 was a gradual, steady encroachment of private finance initiatives and of a wider financialization, in other words, opening up markets to foreign banks and so on. For over 30 years, donor countries have been pushing aid recipient countries to open up their domestic economies to freer trade and foreign investment. And in many cases, aid has been used to achieve these goals. For example, there's been a lot of pressure on recipient countries to uh, support lower trade tariffs, and this is often done by introducing domestic value-added taxes. And then you have institutions like the Adam Smith Institute, the British think tank, so-called, with a consulting division that's been going in to poorer countries and enforcing really regressive value-added tax systems to replace the trade tariffs. This has a very negative impact on poorer people, but obviously helps the big trading companies. In other words, aid has been used as a policy instrument to promote what are essentially neoliberal development goals. Now, the the banking crisis accelerated this process partly because the austerity programmes put into place in Europe and North America have led to reductions of aid budgets, um, and these aid budgets have definitely fallen in most countries, but also because falling demand in the Western economies in Europe and in North America. And investors, they've been looking for some of the rich pickings in developing countries. They want to expand further into private finance initiatives, in utilities, in health services, in education. And above all, they're looking to the poorer countries as as the places where they can expand. So what we're seeing really is an expansion of privatisation, expansion of public-private partnerships in the form of private finance initiatives into the aid recipient countries. And the donor governments are pushing the governments of the recipient countries to create, in their own jargon, more investment-friendly environments. And what lurks behind that is cuts to social environmental protections, tax breaks for big corporations, lower tax rates for corporations, subsidies for big corporations. So this trend in development assistance is toxic this process of financialization involves donor countries using their power, their political power, to push recipient countries into opening up their markets even further to private sector financial players. In other words, the big banks, private equity people, and the big accountants, of course, and promoting private finance initiatives as a mechanism for achieving developmental goals. The experience in wealthier countries has not been good when it comes to this kind of development strategy. I mean, uh, the PFI contracts, the public-private partnerships, so-called, have been pretty disastrous. Well, I I think that's absolutely right. If you look at how the financialization of the economies in the developed countries has proceeded over the last 20 years, it has harmed the quality of development in most countries. This accelerating trend towards financialization of development assistance needs to be challenged. Recipient countries need to be alerted to the long-term pitfalls of using private finance initiatives. Campaigners in uh, Europe dismiss the private finance initiative funding as one hospital for the price of two. That's how outrageous this is. As a long-term development strategy, I'd argue that financialization of, of, of development assistance is yet another sign of the encroachment of financial capitalism into the broader global economy. It's leading to a, a deepening of the finance curse. In other words, finance is extending its powers and extending its monopolist rent-seeking activity, its wealth extraction into a wider range of countries across the globe. Yeah, I was going to say the finance curse looming large there and, uh, you know, very lucrative 
source of corporate welfare. And uh, if you uh, relate that to these same forces behind Brexit, business elites have split really into sort of a globalised manufacturing base of a managerial class. And then you've got the financialization side of things where you have the, the money managers or the money churners. They don't care about manufacturing and uh, jobs and uh, uh, all of those things. And this is the big danger which is facing so many countries. And the City of London is clearly a key player here. One of the drivers behind it. Brexit arguably is that uh, within Europe there's a lot of pushback against the tax avoidance, the tax evasion and the deregulation of financial services in the major international financial centres, London in particular. So London is looking further afield and, and it has a long history of pushing into new areas geographically. Uh, London has been very active, for example, in setting up the International Financial Centre in Nairobi and other international financial centres because they see very rich pickings here and and they have never been that interested in what you might describe as industrial capitalism, in other words, productive activity. They are always looking for opportunities to extract wealth from the economy. That's the danger because this financialization will not be creating new jobs, it will not be innovative, it will not be supporting indigenous local localised industries. By and large it will be very much to the benefit of the big international corporations banks, big accounting firms and so on, and the investors behind them, it will probably harm market quality in these countries and it will certainly involve a great deal of corruption, not least because of all the tax evasion and tax avoidance and the constant political bribery that goes into pushing for tax breaks and for deregulation. It's a very corrosive and harmful process. I can't see any way in which this will improve developmental quality. Okay. Moving on, the European Union elections are coming up in May. That means all change for the members of the European Parliament and the President of the EU Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, ends his five-year term too. Along with him, the competition commissioner, Marguerite Vestager, she's unlikely to come back. And just to remind listeners, she's carried out some really good investigations against EU member states that were breaking European competition rules by offering secret rock-bottom tax deals to huge multinationals that weren't available across the board, so illegal state aid. But, 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 despite all that, we've been wondering, along with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, why she hasn't touched the cases that were exposed by the LuxLeaks whistleblowers, which all centre around the tax haven of Luxembourg, which is the outgoing EU Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker's country. He was Prime Minister there for many, many years. And right from the beginning, when Jean-Claude Juncker became EU Commission President, the Tax Justice Network argued, didn't it, that there was an obvious conflict of interest. As the former Luxembourg Prime Minister, he was one of the main architects of that country's tax haven business model. Luxembourg's currently ranked number six in the Tax Justice Network's Financial Secrecy Index. It's always been right up in the top ten worst offenders globally since the Financial Secrecy Index began. The Tax Justice Networks often referred to Luxembourg as the death star of financial secrecy in Europe. Yeah, look, I I coined that phrase, the death star, because when we um, first started publishing the Financial Secrecy Index in 2009, Luxembourg was ranking right up there. And of course, Luxembourg sits within the European Union single market. It's been one of the founder members of the, what was then the e- European Economic uh, Community. It's been a key player in shaping the European Union in all sorts of ways. And yet there it is, a massive secrecy jurisdiction stroke tax haven. And it really began to kick off in the early 1990s. Jean-Claude Juncker, who's now, of course, uh, has been presiding over the Commission for a long time, he was elected Prime Minister of Luxembourg in 1994. No, sorry, he was elected Prime Minister of Luxembourg in 1995. Since he was elected Premier, Luxembourg saw a massive expansion, particularly of its role as a tax haven for US multinational companies who were using the, uh, the Grand Duchy to shift profits from other countries in Europe through Luxembourg to offshore tax havens. So 
Luxembourg clearly, during Juncker's premiership, became a focus for special deals that were being signed between their tax administration and the big four multinational accounting firms like PricewaterhouseCoopers. And these special agreements allowed them to engage in massive profit shifting, mainly through the use of treasury operations to extend loans to their the subsidiary companies and use the interest on those loans to, for profit shifting purposes. Now, Juncker has claimed subsequently that he was not involved, that all of these special agreements were purely handled at, at, at an official level. Now, frankly, this stretched everyone's credibility because in a very small state like Luxembourg, there is massive overlap between politicians and administrative officials. But it gets worse because the, the, the culture of Luxembourg was quite aggressive. For what it's worth, Luxembourg is one of the few places where I have been physically threatened by a banker. But look at what happened to the LuxLeaks whistleblower prosecuted. And, and this is even worse, the journalist who handled the information, Edouard Perrin, a Frenchman, he was also prosecuted. So this is a country which is, frankly acts as a big bully on the block. Um, and I think that reflects the general political culture that uh, Juncker put into place when he was Premier. OK, and so when he became the European Union's Commission President, that caused great concern for Tax Justice Network, didn't it? It certainly did. In fact, we were arguing that he was unfit to hold this office, particularly at a time after the financial crisis, when it was clear that European, the European Union would have to make significant moves against tax havenry within its own borders. So we were calling for automatic information exchange to be adopted right the way across the Union. We were calling for country-by-country country reporting. We were calling for full transparency of beneficial ownership, not just of companies, but of trusts. And we were calling for the European Union in particular to move towards what's known in, in the jargon as the common consolidated corporate tax base. Now, this is a really important step towards being able to tax multinational companies on a unified basis, so-called unitary taxation. And this is an area where the European Union should be leading the world. Now, Juncker has said all along he's very much in, in support of all of these measures, but actions count louder than words. We haven't seen sufficient action from him. Overall, I think that we can fairly say that Juncker's presidency has been something of a disappointment for the tax justice community. Thanks, John. And those cases, the LuxLeaks cases, showed all of us the true disgraceful state of affairs where member states were cheating other member states out of tax revenue. This month, the tax cast looks at the genie that can't be put back into the bottle. I'm talking to Simon Bowers at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which covered the LuxLeaks scandal. There have been some high-profile investigations from the European Union's Competition Commissioner into massive tax underpayments by Apple and Starbucks and Fiat and Amazon. And EU member states were found to be breaking EU competition rules by offering those companies corporate tax deals not available to smaller companies. But... Those investigations all began before the LuxLeaks scandal broke. And since the LuxLeaks scandal, more investigations have been launched by the competition commissioner, including Nike and Ikea and a French electricity company, but still no investigations have taken place into the cases that were exposed by the LuxLeaks whistleblowers. And that's even though some of them allowed companies to pay less than 1% tax in Luxembourg. So why have the LuxLeaks cases that were exposed nearly five years ago now not been investigated in your view? Well, it's a burning question, really, because you've got to think of it in, in the sense of if you if you regard these as potentially unfair tax treatments, that, that's an issue for competition law. The EU doesn't have competency over uh, matters of tax law. That's a matter for member states. But it, when when things look unfair, in simple terms, that, that becomes an issue of competition law, one company getting advantage of the other. But the obvious person to look at it would be uh, the EU's competition commissioner, Marguerite Vestager. And um, she came out, obviously, there were questions to her very quickly after LuxLeaks, and she came out very firmly and she said, 
in a, uh, effectively a sort of holding statement. She said, yes, we, we're looking at these documents. We consider them market information, she called them. And she said, we will examine it and we'll evaluate whether or not this leads to an opening of a case. And we've not heard anything since. And of course, the great figure looming over uh, that question of whether or not to investigate is Vestager's boss, the uh, commission president, Jean-Claude Juncker, because he, for 20, almost 20 years previously, he served as prime minister of Luxembourg. And so the question is, is he uh, a credible person to oversee the European Union's attempt to deal with this grubby mess that has been exposed just as he's arrived in 2014 as as president of the European Commission. Bear in mind that his knee-jerk response at the time was, well, sort of, we did, there was nothing technically illegal and everyone was at it. But his, if, if, when you dig back down to his record as Prime Minister of Luxembourg, he went to huge lengths to court these businesses and was very, very close to the, the decision making that brought them to headquarter the, the, a lot of their European operations in Luxembourg. To the extent that in, in 2012, Amazon's head of tax, a, a chap called Bob Comfort, uh, he, he did a lot of uh, um, a tour of Europe and he eventually plum for, for Luxembourg as Amazon's headquarters. Then obviously a massive decision, huge company. And uh, shortly afterwards, he was made Luxembourg's honorary consul for the Seattle area. You know, bear in mind, Luxembourg is the EU's second smallest member state, absolutely tiny country. The idea that it should have any diplomatic representation on the west coast of America is, is seems far fetched. But it was a, it was a token, perhaps of Juncker's gratitude and that those kind of little anecdotes really la- left a flavour that he was, uh, uh, let's say, too close for comfort uh, to some of these big, particularly US multinationals, as they looked for the most favourable tax jurisdiction to make their home in Europe. Right, and uh, yes, despite Juncker's attempts to remove himself from the tax-dodging offerings made by Luxembourg. I mean, he was the central architect <laughs> in Luxembourg's accelerated tax havenry business model. But let's talk about the question of legality. It's been used many times in the Luxembourg courts where PricewaterhouseCoopers ruthlessly pursued their former employees and uh, journalists. And um, their argument was made time and time again, and this was repeated by Jean-Claude Juncker himself, that because the whistleblowers didn't expose any illegal activity, that must mean they're not legitimate whistleblowers and therefore not uh, able to enjoy the full protection of the law. Tell me about that. Yes, this this was the, the, the sort of double defence. Where, where, uh, there was nothing technically illegal and, and all member states were indulging in this kind of tax competition in, in any case. But Pairing it back, you know, what, what is an illegal tax ruling under EU law? There's no EU law competency over tax. That's a member state issue except for VAT. So for a tax ruling to be illegal in EU law, for it to be a matter for Juncker's commission, it must be effectively must be unfair. It must give a selective advantage to the company concerned. And so the way that the EU began just before Juncker really came to power, that um, began, to its credit, began tackling these sort of toxic issues was to use this competition law to attack the issues of tax. And you know, it's a bit like catching up with Al Capone on, on, on tax offences ra- rather than his his sort of gangster behaviour. So, yeah, the, the, the question of I- illegality uh, sometimes gets blurred with a sort of moral indignation at the, at the effect of these tax rulings. I think most people, possibly Juncker himself, I mean, he's made nods towards it. He, he accepts that there, there is something toxic. It's a secret tax rulings that suck, um, drain revenues from other member states and allow those revenues to disappear off into tax havens or similar. But as a matter of law, the opportunities for the EU to tackle those kind of tax rulings are limited simply because tax is not a competency of the EU. Member states very jealously guard their uh, rights to determine their own um, taxes. So you've got this situation where the only the only mechanism the EU can use to uh, tackle these uh, corrosive tax rulings 
is through competition law. So it, it's, it's sort of finding an innovative way to tackle offensive problems. Right. And uh, if some of these cases that uh, Antoine Del Toro and Raphael Allé exposed were to be investigated, we might well find that uh, they almost <laughs> certainly should have been never dragged through the courts in the first place because uh, we would have found possibly that uh, from the point of view that uh, there was illegal state aid in those cases, they would have been vindicated in exposing that information. And I should just drop in as well that uh, we at the Tax Justice Network know that uh, questions on legality are always raised to justify a lack of action on tax dodging, and that's kind of the tax avoidance versus the tax evasion argument. Um, And it's weak because we know that at a national level, um, certainly governments aren't rushing to take multinationals and their armies of lawyers to court for several years, (laughs) even if they might very likely win those cases. And that's one of the reasons the European Union as a bloc and what it does over these issues is so very important. And to, to move on to the whistleblowers themselves, Antoine Del Tour and Raphael Allais have always said that despite the harassment and the stress and the loss of their careers, that they would do the same again because exposing the fact that Luxembourg was engaging in what the Tax Justice Network calls 21st century financial piracy was undoubtedly, so undoubtedly in the public interest. I wonder how they feel now and how would you feel if you were Antoine or Raphael or indeed the journalist Edouard Perrin who were dragged through the courts? looking back now and seeing that none of the cases they were involved in exposing have yet been investigated, as far as we know. Well, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, I I think all eyes must be on uh, Commissioner Vestager as as, uh, she gave that holding statement in in 2014, saying she's still looking at whether to investigate or not. But since then, she she has said that the whistleblowers are to be congratulated and praised and that the journalists themselves are to be thanked. So clearly she, she's extending some warm signals to the process. She doesn't, she doesn't see it at all as unhelpful. And she's on the enforcement side. If you look on the policy side and you speak to, I mean, politicians around the world will tell you in veiled terms on the record, but off the record in, with great enthusiasm about what, what an influence that, uh, Raphael and Antoine have had on the whole landscape of tax reform. I mean, I don't think it's possible to overestimate how dramatic their influence has been on the BEPS process, on European tax reform. I mean, you might argue that there are weaknesses with all those reforms, but um, they, we, would not, we would never have got as far as we have without those two individual figures. They really have changed the path of history, I think. Yes, I agree. And, you know, for any future whistleblowers weighing up whether to do the right thing or not, um, what the European Union now chooses to do in terms of whistleblower protections and legislation they're currently considering is really, really critical now. But let's talk about PricewaterhouseCoopers, because the really frustrating thing about these tax scandals is time and time again, we see the big four accountancy firms always managing to slink into the shadows on these occasions. And especially, as you say, the European Union Competition Commissioner, she's investigating member states, not companies. And yet, if investigations into the LuxLeaks cases were to take place, that would and should expose them and their practices more than it has done. Yeah, I mean, the Competition Commission are looking at cases to see if they stand out and offer... I mean, they, they might they might be offering outrageously advantageous tax arrangements for for companies, but if they if they're not selectively favouring companies, then there is no breach of competition law. But it, it certainly seems that just uh, um, measuring some of the tax rulings from the LuxLeaks files against other tax behaviours in other jurisdictions, some of the behaviour is just utterly extraordinary. I mean, for for instance. There's a phrase that crops up in the in the LuxLeaks papers repeatedly, a phrase called deemed interest. That's where um, the Luxembourg tax authorities on, on an interest free loan will pretend that there is interest and they will, as if interest had been paid, they will give an interest deduction on the multinationals tax return in Luxembourg. It is Alice in Wonderland stuff. 
And the idea that that could be in any way part of a, a, a logical international framework of how cross-border tax treaties ought to work is, is just, uh, I think it, it struggles to be believable. Indeed, indeed. And what should happen now, in your view, regarding those original LuxLeaks cases that were exposed nearly five years ago and have been so important in the public debate, but also in what's been happening in the European Commission? I mean, how can they uh, uh, really salvage a situation where they have not actually, as far as we know, investigated those cases? Well, it, it is difficult to see what else the Commission knows. And the Commission has had access to a huge amount of tax rulings, and so they're, they're looking for ones that stand out as, as being distinctly preferential. Those are, that's the criteria they need. However, it just feels as if there has been this enormous pause since the LuxLeaks scandal broke in 2014 at the start of Jean-Claude Juncker's presidency. We're now you know, months away from the end of his presidency. And uh, it looks like, I mean, he said he won't come back. Vestager, the politics in Denmark, mean it's unlikely she's going to come back. There is an opportunity now to show, and it will, it will, it will help Juncker's reputation, uh, his legacy, that, that he was truly independent. Because right now, there is still a stench around LuxLeaks. There's, there's clear water between the, the phrasing that has come out from uh, Juncker and the phrasing from Verstager and indeed many member states, France, Germany and uh, Italy in particular, that they were indignant at the, the LuxLeaks uh, um, revelations. And for um, the, the process to be really reached closure, I think that the, the European Commission needs to see if there is at least one case from the LuxLeaks files. OK, last question. We're speculating because we don't know, but um, could it be that Vestager, the competition commissioner, could be under indirect or even direct pressure not to not to go there because of her boss? Well, I mean, um, Juncker has always made it a um, he's used Verstager's bold enforcement actions as a proxy for his own integrity on this subject. He sort of presented it very early. In fact, right at the start, of when the whole scandal blew up, he said, he said just watch. What, watch what I do in terms of tax reform. And, he, you know, you can, you can say that he's been frustrated and maybe he knew he was always be frustrated. But more importantly, he's always said, look at what Vestager does on enforcement. Look how tough she is. Look how tough my Juncker commission is through Vestager. I will never... If it's an enforcement action involving Luxembourg, it would be inappropriate for him to intervene. However, you, we all know how, how soft power works and, and that there is clearly a conflict there. And that will always cast a shadow on his legacy unless there is action. So we're watching and we're waiting. I've been talking to Simon Bowers at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. That's it from the TaxCast for now. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next month.